You're listening to Get Your Marriage On, the fun and spicy podcast, bringing you new tools and fresh ideas so that you can be the sexiest couple you know. Everyone, welcome back to this episode of Get Your Marriage On. I'm delighted to have my guest, Dana Shea, uh, today. She's a certified personal relationship coach, and she is awesome. Uh, welcome today. Thank you, Dan. I'm happy to be here with you. Thanks. Uh, I was a guest on your podcast a few weeks ago. I've listened to many of your episodes, and I love your approach, and you have a very confident air about you, and how you're, and I love how you just love helping people develop great relationships. How did you get into this? Well, it's, it's so funny. First of all, thanks for being a guest on my show. I love the conversation that we had. I think you brought so much wealth and wisdom to our community over there um, on the podcast. And, you know, I kind of stumbled into relationship coaching. I didn't, when I was little, I didn't think I'm going to grow up and be a marriage and relationship coach when I grow up. But life happens. And as many of us, we have experiences. I got married super young. I was 18. My husband was 21 when we got married. And and we knew nothing about anything. <laughs> we didn't know about who we were, let alone trying to love somebody else and figure out this other person. And so we struggled a lot in our marriage. And I'm really transparent about our struggles, you know, on my podcast and other venues that I share. Um, but there was a, a time when we really wanted help. We realized that we needed someone to walk alongside us and help us. And so we would reach out to different couples or different people that we thought would be the appropriate folks to help us. And we got nothing. It was either people couldn't identify with our struggles. Um, people would try to religialize everything that we were going through or people would just stop talking to us. And so I think it was the third, the latter, that was really traumatic for us because whenever you have someone coming to you and they're being vulnerable and they're being open and they're reaching out for help to get rejected was really hard. And so we said, you know what? Honestly, at that point, we don't know what's going to happen in our marriage, but if we get through this, we are not going to be that. We're going to help other people to be able to overcome the struggles in their relationship. And so that was just like a little seed that was planted. And um, I started you know, my career path. I became a pastor. I answered this call to pastor. And through pastoring, I did a lot of just kind of pastoral care, pastoral counseling. And I found myself working with couples and really finding a passion point there. And so I said, you know, I'm actually going to go get certified for this. I'm going to get some more tools. I'm going to get more knowledge. And I'm going to pursue this because there are so many marriages that are struggling and they don't need to. Like so many of these relationships are in trouble because they don't have the proper tools. And so my job, my goal at that time was to really be able to help people to understand what tools they need practically in their relationships so that they could thrive instead of struggling all the time. What's one of the struggles that you and your husband uh, shared, if you're willing to share? Sure. I mean, I think the biggest thing is just unmet expectations. We were so young when we got married and we had these fantasies of what we thought marriage was going to look like yet neither of us have really had a good example of that. So I come from a, a pretty dysfunctional home where I didn't know my birth father. He and my mom were married, but they divorced before I could even remember who he was. My mother ended up remarrying, and that relationship was just very, very chaotic. My husband, um, did his, his mother did not marry his biological father, but she did marry when he was 11. And so my in-laws, um, they have a healthy relationship, but they didn't really have conflict. So my husband never, ever saw them argue, never saw them go through any of that. So here we are, these two people from totally different backgrounds. I'm seeing conflict all the time, you know, volatile conflict, and my husband's not seeing it. So when we start having conflict, we're both like, we don't know what to do with this. And so I would think that, you know, some of even the symptomatic problems that we begin to have were really just that. They were symptoms of the bigger issue, which was we just did not know what to expect. We weren't trained. We weren't, we had, we went through some premarital counseling, um, but it wasn't, I don't think it was enough. It, it wasn't enough for us to, to really understand like what we were getting ourselves into. And so we began to lash out at each other instead of realizing, hey, we're on the same team here. It was, you know, you're the problem. No, you're the problem. And then that just began the the very quick downward spiral to craziness. 
<laughs> or was it more like, hey, you're the problem? It's like, okay, I won't argue with you. Wait, <laughs> we're not right. getting to the solution. <laughs> yeah, well, it depends on who you ask, right? My husband is very, uh, he's very mild mannered. He's not, he doesn't uh -huh. like conflict. Um, and so I am kind of the one that like, I hate unresolved conflict. And so I don't mind like stoking those fires a little bit and like poking him. And so he didn't want to be poked. He wanted to just kind of like leave it alone. And I would not, I was not willing to leave it alone. And so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you like learn to like get through that? Because conflict so like like there's healthy conflict and there's a lot of unhealthy conflict and but it takes a, a like maturity to mature into understanding like the value of good conflict in like that's how you grow but it takes a certain level of maturity to get there how like any like specific story you can share and like your big aha breakthrough? Of, like yeah. I mean, you hit the nail on the head. It was maturity. Like, again, we were 18 and 21. And so a lot of that was just being immature and not realizing that you can't force someone to come onto your side. So I remember, for example, I uh, we both grew up in Christian homes. And when I was... Uh, I don't know, maybe 14 or so, I kind of deviated from the path a little bit. Didn't do anything too crazy. I've never done drugs. It wasn't any like, quote, big sins, right? But I just felt myself drifting from who I was as a, as a really solid believer. And my husband had always at that point kind of struggled in his faith. So when we got married, neither of us were really walking closely with the Lord. We had a Christian wedding. We were still kind of in church, but we weren't really walking with the Lord. And so a couple years later, when I was 20, almost 21 years old, I had this radical rededication to the Lord and I was on fire for God, like even way more so than I was a, as a child. And so I assumed, again, assuming not, you know, having these unrealistic expectations, I assumed that my husband would just obviously be radically transformed as well. And so he was not. <laughs> and I would... Uh, manipulate him into going to church. I would shame him for not having a close walk with the Lord. I would compare him to, I did all the wrong things. I would compare him to other men who, you know, well, he's doing, he's leading his family. He's reading the Bible with his wife. He's praying over his family and none of those things worked. And so that was all the immature parts of myself, thinking that I could somehow manufacture my husband's relationship with the Lord instead of just worrying about my own. And so I think what changed it for me was a realizing that all of my, you know, works were like filthy rags. <laughs> they were ineffective. They weren't working. And then it was really causing a lot of damage. I was actually broadening. We were already starting to become distant and I was really just broadening um, that distance even more through my crazy, you know, super hyper spiritual approach to him. And so I had to learn how to like, let the Lord lead him. And I am supposed to love him, not try to lead him or try to force him to be this great man of God. I had to, just like the Lord met me, you know, and in my timing, I had to trust that the Lord was going to meet him in his. That's great. Like I, I laugh a little because it, like you're having this great spiritual awakening and your methods to help your husband get on board with the same awakening is antithetical to what you're learning in your exactly. spiritual awakening. <laughs> yeah, that self-righteousness will creep up in there. You know, it's so pharisaical, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> we, we've been saved and transformed by the goodness and the grace of God. The Bible says it's the goodness of the Lord that leads men to repentance. But I, And I knew that in my head, but I was like, it's the goodness of the Lord and also a really devoted wife that will lead men to repentance. He's really good at controlling, manipulating, nagging, and everything too. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and it may not just be spiritual things, but what are the ways we control and manipulate in our relationships? And how, like, it is so common. We all do it. Right. Like, what are some other ways we control and manipulate? Well, I can think from a woman's side, you know, sometimes being overly emotional, turning on the tears, um, silent treatments. Like I specialized in silent treatments. You know, I could oh, teach yeah. whole workshops on them. <laughs> and so, a PhD you know, in how to do it. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, how to do the silent treatment, you know, turning on the emotions. Um, comparison, that's a manipulation. You know, when we even subtly say whether you're comparing your husband to your father or to your brother or to another another man, a coworker, a pastor, you know, that comparison can be another way that we manipulate. Um, 
using what our spouses have told us in confidence against them, terrible manipulation. It's really, really bad. Um, and so, yeah, there's there's all kinds of ways that we will try to exert control over someone else and we'll, we'll downplay it or we'll make excuses for it like I did. You know, well, I'm doing this because I love him, because God, I want him to have a close relationship with you. And if that were really the case, I would have been, I would have been a better Christian to him. Really what it was is I was trying to control his Christianity. And I thought he needs to look like this so that I can feel comfortable, so that I'm not the one having to, you know, do all of these things that I felt were his responsibility. And they were never really his responsibility in the first place. Or it wasn't your responsibility to make him take responsibility for those things in the first place, too. Right, right. Exactly. So... In control and manipulation, I think there's like we can be doing things where we're one upping our spouse. We can also do it where we're one downing our spouse. We can be overt about it and we can also be um, covert about it. Mm -hmm. Like it's also a manipulation to say, uh, okay, you win, you get your way. But deep inside, you really don't agree with that. You're just trying to you know, get them off your back. That's, that's also a form of manipulation and trying to control our spouses to kind of, cause, cause you're really not in it. You're not really sincere. You're not really part of that. So uh, what did you do? Um, so you realize these things, you got to stop control and manipulating. Then what happened? So then I realized that we were dealing with a much larger issue in our marriage, which was infidelity. And this is what, you know, we spend a, a great deal of, of my marriage and relationship coaching is helping couples who have, who have walked through these very troubling, muddy, painful waters of infidelity. And my husband- like adultery and betrayal, absolutely. that kind of- yes. Yes. And our story is a little unique because it happened on both sides. And so, you know, I had this relationship back from high school. Um, and, you know, again, and I'm not, this is not an excuse, but it just goes to show that what I was thinking at that time, uh, being very young, I was about 19 years old at this time. So it was before I rededicated to the Lord. But just the immaturity of thinking that as a married woman, I could still kind of carry on with my uh, with my unmarried male friends in the same way um, was not successful. And then my husband was struggling with issues on his side that I had no idea about. And so here we are, two people living in the same household, dealing with the same issues. I'm attracted to this, this other person. He's having struggles with these other women. And we're both going through the same thing at the same time. Neither one of us really knew it. But I think there were definitely little red flags, you know, that, that I think we saw, but we didn't want to acknowledge them because it was scary. Like, what does this mean if this red flag is true? And so that's kind of when things hit the fan is when we realized, I realized first that my husband had been unfaithful. And then he realized later that I had also been unfaithful. And so that was for sure a trajectory changer for our, for our whole relationship. When that happened, were you like, when you found out your, your spouse or husband was unfaithful, was it devastating to you? Or was that when you really felt like, I'm mad at him for doing the very same thing I'm doing back to him? Or was it more like, I guess, um, for instance, from my own marriage experience, there's been times when I'm really mad at my spouse for something she did. But when I really take a step back and look at it, she's doing the very same thing that I was about to do to her, which mm. would have made her upset. But it was just really convenient that she made the first move. So I had to, I had to, I could justify my anger a little bit, but in the moment, but realizing that that was really harmful because I was just about to do the same thing. Yeah. Myself. So my story is, you know, at the point where I found out my husband had been unfaithful, my relationship was more of an emotional attachment, uh, that outside relationship. So it was, I would definitely still classify it as being unfaithful, but it had not progressed to the, the sexual part yet. Um, it was basically just a very unhealthy friendship that I had with this other person. And so when I found out that my husband had really, you know, gone all the way, if you will, and he had been unfaithful with someone, 
it was definitely justification for me. Like, well, I've been trying to do the right thing and not dishonor my marriage, but this man is out here just acting a fool. And so guess what? I'm going to just, whatever I feel like doing, I'm just going to do. And so absolutely there was that justification. Now, the thing about it though, was even though I wasn't walking with the Lord and I realize everyone who's listening might not be Christian, but I realized I wasn't really walking with the Lord, but there was still that very deep conviction that first of all, Christian or not, this is not who I am as a person. I am not disloyal. I am not a liar. I am not someone with a lack of integrity. Like this goes against who I am as a person. And that deeply affected me so much so that, and not to toot my own horn, but That was a one-time situation, and I never spoke to that person again because I could not bear the weight. I literally was on my bathroom floor crying, feeling like the scum of the earth because of what I had just done. That was not who I was. And so I had, it was still going to be another year, probably a year and a half before I would really rededicate myself back to God. But at least in that moment, I knew that this was not who I wanted to be. This was not who I was. I love that you had that awakening and realization that like, oh, like you've come, you come to yourself. Like this isn't my, this isn't in line with my true identity of who I really am inside as a daughter of God. And, and you're like, I need to, I need to change this. Yeah. Yeah. That could be really helpful in, in all areas, in any relationship, I think. Uh, for the big problems and even the daily small things. Like, how am I going to live in line with who I know I am deep inside today? That's right. Like, even in arguments, you know, we all kind of get pushed to the limit sometimes in our marriages. And I know that there have been times in my own marriage where I'll be very angry and I'll feel myself becoming somebody else, you know, and and I'll remind myself, Dana, that that is not who you are. You, you are not a volatile, angry person. I did struggle with anger for many years and I was delivered of that. Thank God. Doesn't mean I don't get angry today, but I, it does not, anger does not control me the way that it used to. And so I will have to at times remind myself when I feel myself kind of like, okay, I'm about to like boil over the pot. This is not who you are. You know, reel it back in. This is not who you are. And so I think that if we can start having those conversations with ourselves and encouraging ourselves, this is not who you are. Remember who you are. Remember the work that you've done on yourself. Then I think that we would be so much more successful versus just like throwing caution to the wind and being like, well, I'm in the moment right now. I'm upset. I can ask for forgiveness later. You know, and that again is a, it's a fruit of maturity is when you're able to have self-control and to say, this is who I want to be, not what I'm acting and portraying now. And so I have the control. I have the ability to control myself and to tell myself, we're not going to do this. We are going to remember who we are and we're going to act accordingly. I recently reread Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And that's habit one is essentially I am in control of me. Yes. I don't have, I can decide how I'm going to react. With every s- stimulation, there's a response. But in between, as humans, we have this capacity to choose what our response will be. Absolutely. So it might be something that triggers you, makes you angry, or you might respond, you know, lash out. But or you don't. You can choose your response, and that's the magical thing. But it takes. It's like a muscle. You got to keep exercising it, whether it's anger or uh, control or manipulation or whatever. Yeah. Emerson Egerich says in the book, uh, Love and Respect, he says it in this way, my response is my responsibility. And I tell myself that quite often. (laughs) You know, I had a situation last night with uh, some people that I work with and I was like, my response is my responsibility. I feel like a Stepford wife. Like I literally have to, my response is my responsibility. I have to keep saying that because we have to understand that it isn't other people, whatever other people do it does not give us an excuse to act outside of ourselves. And so that's why I would never be able to justify the fact that I made a decision to become unfaithful because my husband was. No, no, no. My response is my responsibility. I could have chosen to respond in a different way, but I didn't. And so I have to take responsibility for what I did and not blame him for what he did. And this ties back into when you wanted your husband to step up, to be more, uh, you know, to increase his walk with God, to be more Christian. And 
you kind of more, it was more reactionary, like, I, w- I want you to do this, control, manipulate, whatever, instead of just saying, this is my, how, how I'm choosing to respond mm-hmm. to this situation and, and really taking control of that. Right. Yeah. I want to go back and talk about, you talked about um, early on when you both sensed something was amiss in your relationship that, you know, you saw the red flags, but you you kind of turned a blind eye to them. You kind of, why do, why do we do that in our relationship so often? We just kind of see a problem or we have a problem, but we, uh, why don't we just bring them up and address them in, in ways that can really resolve and prevent even bigger problems from happening? Why do we tend to hide and hold secrets like that? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is fear, fear of so many things. I can know for me, it was fear of the unknown. Like if I really allow myself to acknowledge what I'm feeling and sensing in my marriage, which was that my husband was taking the energy that he should have been given to me and putting that elsewhere. If I'm really willing to acknowledge that there's a fear of rejection. Does he really not love me? Am I not enough? Are we going to get divorced? Is our family, because we had a child, you know, is our family going to be fractured? So it's it's all the fear. Um, it, it, you know, what what is that going to look like? Fear of the unknown is huge. We don't know what we don't know. And so it's scary. And so then we have to then take responsibility for then how am I going to respond? Okay, if we do get divorced, what does that mean for me? I'm 19 years old at this point. Where am I going? How am I going to provide for myself? All of those questions, you know? And so I think sometimes it's just easier just to ignore it so that we don't have to actually go down the road of the unknown. The unknown is a scary place. And fear is really the bedrock of so many of the world's issues. Why are people prejudiced? Because of the fear of the unknown. They don't want to know another culture because what if those people are actually not at all who I thought they were? What's that going to mean for me and my response toward them? You know, we don't balance our checkbooks because of the fear of, oh my goodness, if I really see how in the red I am every month, what is that going to mean for my lifestyle? So I'll just pretend like, no, we're, we're good. You know, we do things out of fear all the time because we don't want to acknowledge the responsibility that's going to be required on our part when we actually know the truth. So we'll just pretend like we don't know. So how do you get through that? Well, sometimes you don't have a choice because what happens is you can ignore the red flags all day long, but then life happens. So if you keep not balancing your checkbook and not paying your bills on time, eventually you're going to get a notice on your front door saying, get out. (laughs) Um, Sometimes in a marriage, you are going to stumble upon an affair that you tried to ignore, but now it's chosen to reveal itself to you. It, you know, if you are having symptoms in your body and you know that you need to go to the doctor, there are all these red flags in your body, but you're like, mm, I don't want to acknowledge that. Well, you might something, tr- you know, traumatic might happen that forces you to go get the help that you need. And I really believe that's the grace of God. I, of course, I don't believe that God wants these things to happen. God doesn't want someone to be unfaithful in their marriage, but he also doesn't want us walking around in the dark, being ignorant of our true condition. And so he allows us to experience these traumas in life. He allows us to go through these painful moments so that we can wake up and say, okay, this is the the real state of my marriage right now. This is the real state of my life. Now, what am I going to do? I don't have the option to be ignorant of these things anymore. Now I have to face reality and to decide where we're going to go from here. I love what you said. And it reminded me about Brene Brown and her work on vulnerability and things like that. How that all started for her is she did, she studied people that went through really awful, tough life situations. And she interviewed hundreds of people, maybe thousands. And they, they all, kind of fell into one of two buckets, people that were able to like thrive and get through it okay, and people that are really crippled through it. And then she went and studied what is it about their attitudes, lifestyle, what is it that made the biggest difference? And the one thing that she found is those that really succeeded through those hard times had a strong conviction that they were good enough as a person. As flawed as they are, as messy as life is, deep down inside, they knew they had value inside, intrinsic. And whether that comes from God or from within, you have that strong, uh, like, 
uh, self-worth. You're able to self-validate instead of looking outside sources to for people to prop you up, prop up your ego, so to speak. I need it's it's harder to look through the trials of life in in your relationships and marriages when uh, you're relying on other people or your partner or your perception that you want to manage of other people of you to make to kind of keep things going rather than it's m- much better when you can like find that within you that deep yes within you yes absolutely and i assume as a coach that's like the premise of everything you do is help people kind of find that within them mhm yeah you have to be self aware you know we do these uh one of uh, early on actually the first session usually i will have if i'm doing couples coaching i will have them talk about what they so i will have the individual say what their strengths are what their weaknesses are and then i will have their partner share what they feel their their person's strengths and weaknesses are and so then we we flop you know we flip flop okay. and i want to hear from the individual first what they feel like they're strong because so many people they don't know what their strengths are they don't know what their weaknesses are so if you don't know those things how in the world could you ever capitalize on your strengths and work on your weaknesses you won't so you have to be self aware you have to know yourself and this is the problem with sometimes and i'm not knocking all young marriages but i i do not recommend people get married at 18 and 21 like i did because you're not self aware you're you're a baby you you i was barely 18 as a matter of fact my mother had to sign my marriage license because we applied for it when i was 17 you know and so how do you think that you would be able to come into a full you know whole wholesome relationship with another person if you don't even know who you are you're not even aware of these basic things like what are some of the things that i like uh there's a movie coming out um coming to america too we're gonna watch it later but coming to america one is like one of my all-time favorite favorite movies and there's this um scene in the movie where um prince akeem is like looking for or his he, they're about to arrange this marriage for him his parents right and so he's asking this bride he's like what do you like and she's like whatever it is that you like and he's like like ever everything that he asked her it was like whatever you like whatever you like and that was not uh, sexy to him. It wasn't. It what he. It wasn't desirable for him. He was like, I don't want that. I don't want you to like everything that I like. I, basically, what he's saying is, I want you to be self aware enough to know what you like. What bl- what brings you pleasure? We talk about this with couples that we're coaching through sexual dysfunction. Like, what do what brings you pleasure? There's so many couples who, especially women, who have no idea what brings them pleasure they don't know, they don't know because they're not self-aware. And so I think before we can even work on how to build a a better relationship or how we can strengthen a marriage, that is like pivotal. That is like foundational that you have to know who you are at the end of the day. I love that. You have to know who you are at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Any success stories that you can share, you can change names or whatever of people you've coached any stories of how you kind of walk them through that process? Yeah. So I'm thinking about one, uh, one couple in particular who we started off doing like pre premarital coaching. So they weren't even engaged. Um, and I honestly, I love when couples come to me at that state before they bought the ring. And because honestly, let's be real. You've just dropped several thousand dollars on a ring. You're now putting deposits down on venues and you're paying people it's difficult to, to have a couple put the brakes on at that moment because they're already so financially invested. So I really appreciate the fact that this particular couple I'm thinking about came to me before any of that was done. And so they had some challenges that they were trying to work through in their relationship. And so they reached out. And so we started their coaching. And I could tell pretty early on that this might not be a, a good situation, not that they weren't good people. I love them both dearly. But I just realized that there's some pretty significant issues here that this might need to kind of slow down. Well, my job as a coach is not to tell you what to do. It's to ask you questions so that you can come up with your own assessment. And so um, a few weeks in, the female partner reaches out and she tells me that, that they indeed did break up. And so 
I was like, well, I don't know if it was me who broke you up or if it was you guys. But at the end of the day, we're still, you know, we were still able to work with her as an individual. And so she's coming to to understand some of these self-aware issues. Why did I allow myself to be mistreated in these other relationships? Why didn't I stand up for myself here? So that like heart work is what I call it, like really doing the heart work of understanding that you are a person that is worthy of dignity, honor, and respect, that no one should mistreat you or treat you like you are an option, Um, that when someone dedicates their life to you in a marriage situation, that they have to bring 100% of who they are and you bring 100% of who you are. Like we're really able to dive deeper into some of those things without this other partner. And I don't know, they may end up reconciling. I love them both to death. I think they're a cute couple, but it's got to be more than just you being a cute couple. You know, you've got to make sure that foundationally that you're in alignment or as the Bible would call it, being equally yoked um, together with someone. And I think that's probably one of the biggest causes of divorce, honestly. Like we think it's communication. We think it's lack of finances, lack of sex. But at the at the core, I think it's two people being unequally yoked, not having the, even two Christians. You can be a Christian and, and pair up with another Christian and still be unequally yoked. If one person is, uh, their val- your value systems are different. Um, you approach conflict in wildly different ways. Someone's just stubborn and self-righteous and the other person is is humble and gentle. Like all of these things, you can work through those things. I'm not advocating couples who feel like they're unequally yoked to divorce. You can work through them, but it's gonna be a big challenge. And I think some of that, some of that can be avoided on the front end when you say, okay, let's have a real deal analysis. Let's literally put our relationship out on the table and let's, you know, look at, me as an individual. And then you have to look at yourself as an individual and let's see how are we going to meld these two lives together in a successful way. And that takes a lot of work, which is why a lot of people just bypass coaching, counseling. They don't want to do the work again, because sometimes we're more comfortable with just not knowing than if we open up a can of worms, if you will. I had a girl who told me that um, she, I, she she had just gotten engaged and I was really happy for her. And I said, let me know if you need me to do your premarital coaching. And she goes, oh, no, 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 we're not going to do that because I wouldn't want to open up the can of worms. And I was like, girl, <laughs> you don't have to open up the can of worms. Those can, That can of worms is going to get opened. You can either do it now on the front end or you can do it year two of your marriage. But I have a sad reality for you that that can of worms is going to get opened. <laughs> right. Thank you. To wrap this up, how can we apply these concepts of like each person showing up to be their best self, mm-hmm. uh, not no longer ignoring issues, but uh, addressing them head on and really thinking through our identity of, of who we are and tie that all into uh, enhancing our sexual relationship? Because I believe sex is like, the most vulnerable act that we do with with another human being. And it's the one thing that we share with our spouse and our spouse only. And it's a beautiful gift from God. And when done right, can really bond two people together more than anything else. How do all these things kind of play together as, I don't know, to make a great sexual relationship? Wow, that's a great question. You know, I think earlier we were talking about manipulation and there can't be any manipulation in the bedroom. Like if you want to have a healthy sexual relationship with your with your uh, spouse, you've got to get rid of all the manipulations. You've got to get rid of, you know, the oh, I'm so tired every night. If you don't want to have sex, you need to own it and you need to say, I don't I don't enjoy this. And you might not need to say it in that way to your spouse, but say it to yourself. I don't enjoy this. And I need to figure out why I don't enjoy it. And again, not ignoring it, but being willing to walk down the road of, let me uncover why I don't enjoy this. Is it painful? Do I feel used? Do I feel disconnected? Um, Is it boring? Like, what is it? Ask yourself those questions. And then the other thing I think is, you know, realizing that a healthy sex life is a part of a healthy marriage, unless, of course, there's some sort of debilitating physical issue. Someone just can't physically. Um, But understanding that, like, you have to, again, take responsibility for your part. And so as a woman or as a man, you can't just lie there (laughs) motionless and not 
and not participate in the process. Like you have to participate in the process. And one spouse, usually in a marriage, you've got one spouse who's the more, you know, higher sex drive spouse. And then that maybe that person doesn't necessarily mind initiating a lot. But I like to tell women, I do a lot of talking to women's groups and young women, especially like your husband wants you to initiate. He really does. So you might not have to like go from A to Z all by yourself, you know, but initiate, start it. He will gladly, you know, take it from there. And so I think that um, deferring to one another is is really healthy in a marriage, checking in on each other, asking those questions to each other. Do you like this? Is, does this feel good to you? Like all of those things, I think is is really big in, in helping couples to have a healthy sex life. And then I think I'll just wrap it up with, you know, understanding that there are times and seasons of our marriages. There are going to be seasons where you're not really feeling particularly in the mood. And it could be because there's an underlying problem in your marriage, or it could just be life. Maybe you just recently had a baby, or maybe you're recovering from a sickness, or maybe there's some depression going on, or who knows, you're being overworked. There's all these reasons, right, that sometimes we just aren't in the mood. And I think a healthy marriage gives grace for those seasons, but it doesn't just leave those seasons unattended. A healthy spouse is going to ask that spouse who's being affected, how can I help? You know, I'm not just trying to get you in the sheets, but I'm really concerned about what's going on with you and your life. Like, is there something that I can do? Can I pray for you? Can I, do we need to seek outside help? Do you need to go and get on some depression medication? Like, what is it? How can I help you? And I think that's really the heart of love is when you look at your spouse is more than just a body, you know, they're more than just someone to meet your needs, but they are like a full human person who you get the privilege of caring for. And so I would just encourage couples to come into your sexual relationships as honestly, as open, as humbly as you can. Give grace for each other in those seasons and learn what it truly means to love each other by caring for the whole person. I love it. That's great. Great way to end. Thank you. If people want to reach out to you, what's the best way to find you? Thanks, Dan. So people can reach out to me on my website. Um, there's two websites, actually. So danashay.com, D-A-N-A-C-H-E.com. You'll be able to find all my coaching services and e-courses and workshops and all of that there. And then the podcast is Real Relationship Talk. So if they go to realrelationshiptalk.com, they'll be able to follow the podcast, subscribe. You can subscribe on every everywhere that podcasts are played all of my social media handles and email, all that stuff are on both websites. Very good. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. We hope that you enjoyed this episode of Get Your Marriage On. And if you did, we would love it if you would take a few seconds to give us a rating on iTunes and to share the show with your friends. They'll thank you for life. Once you've done that, you can head over to GetYourMarriageOn.com for more resources about today's topic and to download our amazing marriage apps. Now go get your marriage on.